culturally, we lack physical education. You know, and if you look at some of the work from uh, like George Hebert and he, his whole thing was like, you need to move to be purposeful. You need to move to be useful. And he was really about teaching people how to like, you should be able to pick up a heavy log or be able to pick up a person. If you were in some type of emergency situation, you should be able to climb a ladder. You should be able to run. You should be able to grapple. You should be able to box. Mm. If you can't do those things, especially if like life becomes chaotic, you might fall into a situation where you're an extreme handicap. Traveling to consciousness, exploring spiritual journeys to find answers in uncertainty. What is up, Conscious Monkeys? Welcome to another episode of Traveling to Consciousness. As always, I'm your host, Clay Kateri. Today's guest is the number one trainer for A-list celebrities. He's the leader of the anti-chair movement. He is the host of the Align podcast. He is the author of the Align method. And if that wasn't enough A's for you, Conscious Monkeys, welcome to the show, Aaron Alexander. Aaron, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me, man. I think, what did you say? The, the leader of the anti chair. I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty chair neutral. I think chairs are fine. It's just the the manner in which we use the chair, and then the level of repetition and chronic usage, which is the issue. But we'll okay. Talk about that. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Because it's it's funny because if you're watching, you can see this, but if you're listening, this is actually the first podcast I decided to record, and I'm actually sitting on the ground oh, cool. <laughs> for this podcast. That's awesome, man. I love that. Yeah. I was like, I got to get how, into this. How, how is it? How how wildly uncomfortable is it down there? <laughs> All the way down on the ground. It's interesting. It's definitely the hip flexors that are really feeling it. Okay. Well, what's the height of your hips? Because there's 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 method to to all of this. Okay. Well, let's dive into the method. I've got like a little bit of no, it's too a low. blanket. No. Yeah not happening so your hips need it depends on your level of flexibility with, with largely with your adductors mainly adductors being the muscles in the inside of the leg um so if those are pretty lengthy then and you're able to get the knees down low close to the ground when you're in like a cross leg position then you could have what you have but if not it's going to be really uncomfortable for your back so essentially the cardinal rule which you can just stop listening to the podcast after this and just take this information and move on with your life would be raising your hips up above the height of your knees while you're sitting. And that also mm -hmm. goes for while you're sitting on a chair as well. So if you're sitting in a chair and you were to place a ball to have here, cause I'm, you know, doing stuff with my hands while we're doing this conversation, uh, onto your femurs, your leg bones, and it would roll back towards your genitals, your hips, then you're setting your pelvis and your lower back up for essentially like you know problems instability disc herniations and just you know general dis-ease so just make sure that when you're sitting your hips are up above the height of your knees for the rest of your life for the most part and it would be greatly advantageous for your longevity health strength development and all the things i'm gonna readjust real quick to get my hips up a little bit higher sort that sort that <laughs> shit out <laughs> yeah yeah don't want that impact yet that's the thing we do we just lack culturally we lack physical education um you know and if you look at some of the work from uh like george hebert which is the the fellow that that founded um how do you call it like movement natural or natural method and he was a, a french militant of sorts at, from like the early 19th 1900s I, I believe that's that's when he was around i think his book came from the it was like the 1920s or something i just recently read it uh and he his whole thing was like you need to move to be purposeful you need to move to be useful and he was really about teaching people how to like you should be able to pick up a heavy log or be able to pick up a person if you were in some type of emergency situation you should be able to climb a ladder you should be able to run you should be able to grapple you should be able to box mm. if you can't do those things especially if like life becomes chaotic you might fall into a situation when you're an extreme handicap and we just we don't really get I, I think really strong sound education on like the mechanics of how to move effectively in our, in our body. And that would be something that's just like baseline ground zero. You're going to spend whatever unnecessary percentage of your life sitting on a chair. It'd be very from person to person. You should understand the mechanics of how to do that. Well, in my opinion, you know, but like how many people ever really got that simple little tip of like, Oh yeah, put your hips up above the height of your knees because the shape of your lumbar, uh, particularly the, the L5 S1 vertebra, like the lowest vertebra in your spine, they are wedge shaped compared to the rest of the, the vertebra are more like hockey pucks. So 
that wedge, the wide edge, edge of the wedge is facing towards your abdomen. So you want to kind of lean yourself slightly forward when you're seated on a chair, when you're deadlifting, when you're squatting, all those things, because it just creates more ease for those discs in your lower vertebrae. Mm. It's like, you shouldn't just know that. It's not a big deal. It's like, like of course. <laughs> like, if you're six years old, be like, yeah, we, we know that. Well, and speaking of knowledge that should almost be obvious and just like natural or even taught at a basic level, and this kind of tie us back in, is almost like the mindfulness, the awareness, which we tend to focus on mostly on this podcast. And so as like a little bit of a foundation piece for the next hour or so that we're going to talk, I would love to dive into setting that foundation and that intention, which I was going through, I was going through Instagram and I was like, okay, like, you know, going through my intuition saying, who's the next person I should reach out to for this podcast. And I came across Align podcast, Instagram at Align podcast. And I was like, okay, like alignment, that's right up my alley. I like being spiritually aligned and I clicked on it. And all the content was this gym bro just working out in the gym. (laughs) And I was like, (laughs) in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I was like, my intuition's like, why am I Aaron Alexander? I'm like, why am I reaching out to this guy? And it's just kind of like this little nudge was like, trust me, trust me. And I check out Spotify and I type in Aaron Alexander to look for any podcast you've done in the past. And the first one that popped up was you on Aubrey Marcus. And I was like, oh, I was like, if this guy can go have a conversational bout with Aubrey Marcus, I was like, he can definitely speak on the idea of spirituality and even combine it with the nature of our body and the way that these two elements, which it feels like in our today's society, we almost separate the body and the spirit. But really, if one of them's out of alignment, then it's going to pull the other one out of alignment as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate the the investigation and the willingness to go beyond the Jimbro. I intentionally do Jimbro because one, I think I am a Jimbro in a lot of ways. Um, I say that and, with all due respect. Two, <laughs> no, I like I like Jimbro. I'm pro Jimbro. Okay. I think it's great. Um, and, and but I intentionally lean into that because I I, I think historically I have had a bit of an allergy to being conflated in like the kind of fluffy new age lack of groundedness mm. movement. And so I, I, I value most of the aspects that come from the quote unquote spiritual world. Uh, and then oftentimes that spiritual world, I think in, in some ways you could look at it, if you want to look in kind of like a dualistic type perspective, it's like very feminine, it's fluid, it's artistic, it's deeply listening, it's like, it's like nurturing, it's all of these things, but there's not a lot of uh, containment and structure and foundation and support, you know? And so then it's like, whoa, that's where this like kind of Western pragmatism, you know, analytic mind, science, all of that. It's like, well, that's like all containment to the point that it can become kind of like vapid and dry if that's where your mind exclusively lies. And so I, I really personally enjoy existing in the, the liminal space between that Eastern philosophical and Western analytical world, because I think they're both incredibly valuable. And so, but I, I personally, from like a, a visual perspective and the things that I kind of lead with talking about is mostly like gym bro, you know, let's teach you how to get more jacked. Let's teach you how to get more fit. Let's teach you how to, you know, make, feel more confident and stoked about being in your body. Uh, if your back hurts, let's work on that. If your knee hurts, if you, you know, your ankles are stiff, let's sort that out. Comma, this also probably is or could be associated to the way that you feel and could be associated to deeply held uh, contractive patterns that may or may not have manifested themselves when you were maybe in the embryological phase or maybe when you were an infant or maybe when you were a toddler or maybe when you were a teenager. And then it's like, oh my God, this is whole physical body is like a big conversation. You know, and then it, it gets more interesting. But I think if, you, if, if one starts off from my bias if one starts off overly out there and it's like you know your bicep is a part of your consciousness tied to your great grandmother or whatever i'm kind of like oh <laughs> you know but if it's like no you have pain you you know yeah. every time you put your arm up over your head you have like this frozen so you need to sort this out let's sort that out and now that we have a buy-in now maybe we can start to talk about like you know quote unquote like deeper topics but i mean the body itself even a topical level i think is quite you know, deep and profound, you know, it's, it's all deep and profound. 
So oh, sometimes sure. the spiritual world can get a little biased towards like, oh, like ayahuasca is more spiritual than like, you know, whatever, taking a walk in a park, you know, just being with yourself without the supplementation of traveling to a new dimension. It's like, bro, this, this dimension is also pretty powerful. It's pretty trippy too at sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. As much as we just want to play it off. Yeah. So then where do you, do you kind of see that there's a way that you, when you're working with somebody or you're even trying to discover maybe a new technique or something that you're able to either bring in that feminine into the world of working out and science. And then even when you're having a conversation that might be more spiritually based, is there a way that you try to pull in the masculine into that world of a little bit more feminine, intuitive, flowy energy? just depends on who you're talking with you know, so that i think that's what the, the value in a if you're ever around someone that seems to teach well it's like wow that person something about them you know they just they educate well typically it's because they're it's not because they're doing the same monologue to you in this room in that room in the next room in the next room they've done for the last 20 years it's they're talking to you like that's, mm -hmm. they're, they're bridging that connection. Like, okay, this is how I talk to you. And I'm just, you know, I'm working to, to better myself as a teacher. Um, I think I have a, a lot of work to, to go in, in that realm and, you know, as a student, all the different things, but I think it's, it's really being very specific to, okay, is this person excessively structured, analytical, superficial, gym bro, you know, everything is science based or I'm not interested, you know, or is this for that person, I'd be like, okay, let's maybe lead into that, but I'm probably going to do a lot more listening, you know, and do a lot more kind of like, maybe let's, let's just do some, some breath work stuff and kind of like see where that goes. Or maybe let's just, we're going to start off and do something and just something more like flowy because you've already over like overwhelmed yourself in this other structure side. Mm -hmm. But then if you get another person that comes in and they have like psychedelic tie dye, stretchy pants on, you know, and they just got done doing a Vipassana retreat and they have their, you know, dreaming journal that they're working on before the session. And they might be kind of hypermobile might be something that could be a thing with that person. They're very flexible. They're very open. They're very spacious, but it might be hard for them to kind of stay on task. They might, maybe they showed up, you know, 15 minutes late for the session. Uh, maybe they have a lot of ideas you know, I want to do this. I want to do, they have so much creativity, but they kind of don't seem to like get started and follow through with many things. And it's like, Oh, okay. Well for you, I think we need to deadlift. Mm -hmm. Definitely deadlift. Let's like teach you how to squat. Let's like load your body and have you feel that feedback of resistance. And I want you to just mm, like learn how to lean into that resistance and you're not going to change or change topics or pick up your phone. We're just going to lean into this resistance and that's going to be your practice. So and it so becomes you, really like movement and exercise can really truly become like a quote unquote, like spiritual you know, life development practice. Oh, I feel that all the time, man. I, I know if I take, even if I have spiritual questions, and I take them into the gym. You, it, it almost feels as if there are certain questions or blockages i mean for lack of a better word that actually do get stuck in certain parts of the body and by just working out you move that energy through in a certain way that it is able to express itself or bring you new ideas or new insights into that that question or feeling that you had or you were trying to explore in the first place yeah yeah that's like bessel van der kalk or peter levine awakening the tiger within is a good resource for that Bessel can't bessel Vander Kalk's his seminal book around that is called um, the body keeps the score. Um, you know, there's tons of, of other books like that. Robert Sapolsky has a good one. Why zebras don't get ulcers. Um, there's like, I, I, I wrote about it in my book, the Align method, which I, I've largely was referencing, you know, those people for the most part uh, and my own work with, with clients. But I, I like to come back to actual, like what's data suggesting this along with anecdotal experience. Um, and, it's a very blurry, nebulous space the con from my perspective, the concept of trauma being stored in the body. I don't exactly personally know how it works. I know personally from my anecdotal experience uh, and working with other people, um, it feels like there is a certain level of science and like physics to it. Um, an example that I, I have 
I'm presently working with a somatic therapist, which essentially means like we, it's a kind of a hybrid of like we talk, uh, and then he has me, um, listen into my body. And he's like, just like, let's just sit with your body. You know, you did this before this conversation a little bit, you know, and just like notice if you feel any, just if anything comes up, you're not like actively objectively looking, you're just noticing and seeing if anything you feel, you know, comes up. And particularly kind of, it might be in relation to this conversation that we had, which was like kind of heavy. And, you know, if you sit with yourself or if I sit with myself and just like allow myself to listen, some of those maybe what could be just like annoying aches or pains that most people probably could resonate with. Like, oh yeah, I have my thing, my back or my shoulder or whatever. Um, Oftentimes it is merely physical. And it is something where it's like, oh, you just have some inhibition of these muscles and we just need to work on that. And then oftentimes, particularly things that have like been more chronic and been around for a very long time, um, maybe they're like deep kind of in like the torso or maybe like the the viscera organs, places like that, you know, back. Uh, if you do allow the space to kind of lean into that, I, I wouldn't have believed this, you know, five years ago or something. I'd be like, no, this is who I'm, I'm, as, I think I'm very skeptical as far as people that are skeptical go. Like, I think I'm very skeptical and I've had myself many like embodied experiences with that where I'll, I'll be goddamn like those parts start to speak. If you actually allow yourself to listen and those parts are, have for me, it's a lot of visuals start to come up and you allow your consciousness to travel. Just like if you were maybe doing a really long meditation or maybe you're doing some type of psychedelic thing or whatever the thing is, you know, visualizations and stuff come up. Like you have access to that in just normal waking life. It's just most of us have our bandwidth is going to cell phone, work, computer, you know, girlfriend. It's like on this plane, but there's a lot of stations we have access to. And if you allow yourself to listen into that, I would just be my suggestion. Just allow yourself to kind of like listen, maybe just a couple channels deeper into some of those sensations in the body and make sure you're very still when you, when you do it and kind of like, you know, releasing most distractions and whatnot, just really listen in. And, um, in my experience with, with that, I've, I've been like, oh my God, I've had this, you know, one particular example, which was kind of recent. I've had this, like this, like boy, you know, me. It was like hiding behind a wall and it was like very scared and like sad has like kind of like the sad, scared kind of vibe to the boy. And it was scared of something on the other side of the wall. And I was able to talk to the boy. I'm like, I'm like my adult self is standing here with myself talking to myself as a boy because I'm listening into that part. And the boy starts to feel seen and starts to feel heard and starts to feel a little bit safer. And suddenly I start to feel this like weight that I didn't realize I I had had start to kind of just like dissipate a little bit and just like, oh, like, wow, interesting. So there was a part, this is my anecdotal experience, but there's a part, this is like three weeks ago, but there's a part of me that has been, I think, held like a contracted pattern, I believe, since I was a little boy. This is common in the world of trauma work. If you have some type, like the, like the meaning of trauma technically comes from Latin word meaning wound, uh, but the, like the description of trauma, the way that we use it in culture is some uh, situation scenario that, or information that was too much for you to process in that moment. So instead of actually being able to circulate it and move it through the body and the mind, I'm like, huh, okay. You just stuff it down and kind of repress and bypass and like, no, not going to feel that. <laughs> push that, that down the the physics of that with in in like human consciousness and psychosomatic you know biology is it that information gets imprinted it gets held in buddhist philosophical terms they call this a samskara if you've ever done like any type of you know buddhist stuff sit in meditation for a while so you, you'll start to feel these samskaras come up samskara translates um, to, uh, imprint is the, is the Sanskrit meaning of it. So that we have these imprints that come up as a product of traumas that we've had in the past because we sit and we listen in with them and we be with them. And, you know, we actually like allow those start to come to the surface. They're able to come to the surface to actually be healed. And a lot of that contractive bracing, holding anxiety, um, you know, tr tr trouble sleeping, racing thoughts, 
uh, all of the different things, emotional eating patterns, addictive behavior, all of it, mostly avoidant bypassing patterns to get out of actually being with our, you know, what we don't want to feel. And we haven't wanted to feel since we were whatever age. You start to address that a lot to come to the surface, it like, oh, it can actually start to heal. And that I think there is actually like a certain level of consistency and almost science to that, but it's just too tough for science to to really put that into a bucket and a beaker and analyze that and say, oh, here's, you know, here's the data on on that. But I, I'm I'm pretty sure there's a certain level of physics to the way that contractive bracing, traumatic patterns can get held in the body and the tools to be able to you know purge and release and come into relationship with them yeah there there for sure is a is a link there that would be amazing if we can get to the place with science to identify how that happened because i know even in my very first ceremony with plant medicine that it was a very similar situation sexual trauma well i guess yours wasn't sexual trauma but mine was sexual trauma from the past that I kind of had mentally said, okay, this happened. It was wrong. Let's move. I'm past it. Mm. But then, you know, it was very much that same. I believe it's called like childhood, like regression. Parenting. Is it parenting though? Whenever you're Repa- like, re- reparent, reparenting, you could say maybe kind of like, re- yeah, yeah. Where, where you're talking to your younger self, you know, you're yeah. like, you almost create this division of self you're like okay there's me as a younger kid and here's how i acted in this situation and the energy that this this quote-unquote former self of me was and you can sit there and kind of talk to him you're like hey like this is why this was this is why this happened like i still love you and you Mm -hmm. then and even myself i like my legs i and again anecdotal of course but my legs afterwards it just felt like 20 pounds lighter it just felt like there was this huge weight that was kind of just lifted off of me just by talking to myself as a kid. Yeah. And realizing like that I had this idea come up, which I'm sure isn't mine. It was mine for the moment of, <laughs> of stumbling into it. But I'm sure many, many people have said probably the exact same thing or similar things. But they we're not just however old you are right now. You know, how, how old are you? 28. 28. Yeah. You're not just you're not just 28, you know, Clayton. Like, cool, this is who I am. This is the entirety of who I am. I'm 28 years old, Clayton. Boom, got it. You you are, it's not just you were talking to that boy out there. Like, you are that boy. And you can, there's certain modalities of, of therapy, you know, like gestalt therapy would be an example of that, where maybe you would like put that boy into like a pillow and be able to conversate with that boy. But even that is a, it's like a, a heuristic guide or like a tool to start to re-embody and reintegrate that aspect of yourself into yourself. Mm. You know, so it's not, I have this boy out here and I have this girl. It's, it's like, you know, like, you're still that boy. You're still that little girl. And, and, and I, I, I believe that when, when, if there are little traumatic bumps along the road, just repressed moments, bypass moments, too much information, can't process, Let's, you know, let's just, just stash that to the side. Relationships largely, I think intimate relationships typically are like the really, like the longest levers in this, in my, in my experience, you know, also doing it, having a business relationship with yourself, you know, having a family, which, you know, becomes kind of a similar thing as probably an intimate relationship. Um, I don't have any kids, um, but they start to serve as reflective mechanisms or tools to start to be able to mirror back on those parts of yourself of like, oh, that part when you were six, still not healed. That part when you were 15, still not healed. Mm. And when you're just alone with yourself, you can't really see that. But it's like, you are still carrying the entirety of your life. And if any of those parts are repressed or bypassed or skipped over, it becomes luggage. If it gets integrated, and it gets processed and it gets digested, it's, it kind of just goes into like flow. You're like, ah, oh, cool. My whole timeline whew, flow, like, God, it feels good. Because yeah. now I have the spaciousness to be connected with everything. I, there's like a clarity. But any person that has wobbles along that timeline they will start to inform the way that you navigate relationships and business and all of the different things. 
And that, I mean, I think the greatest thing that a person gift that a person to have themselves is just humbling themselves and be like, I don't know, you know, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think I have all the answers. And, you know, if you ever go to something that's like, and I've been to some AA meetings, which I don't think you're supposed to talk about going to AA meetings, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not like an AA person, so I, I don't know the rules, but generally I don't think you're supposed to talk about it. Maybe just don't uh, name people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, in that, it's interesting to get to, to be around uh, people that are very different than what I'm accustomed to being around. Like that type of container where people are like rock bottom in the dirt. I, I ruined my family. I ruined my job. I tried to kill myself. I, I, I wasn't even successful at that. I, I completely have been out of control and I, I need someone else. I need help. There's something really like, Oh, wow. Like that's, that's like relieving in, in a way there's something like kind of empowering about that in a way of like, take the wheel, Jesus, I'm not in control. There's something like, I think, especially from like the, the masculine, you know, I don't know, at least maybe just my, my world, I don't really want to be perceived as weak. I don't really want to be perceived as a, like a nuisance, you know, or, or something that's like, oh, like I'll help you. Like I'm the helper. Let's just get things straight here. Like you can be helped. I'm I'll help. Oh yeah. You know, and, and that's a very common thing. And as long as a person navigates life in that approach. Um, you know, they're not going to heal the parts of themselves that need to, and and that's fine. You know, maybe they they don't they they're in a a, a uh, epoch of their life where they really there's a storm and they actually need to protect, and it's not their time to heal. Like they need to protect, but at some point, you know, it would be probably supportive for most people to say like, okay, the storm clouds are down, like let's 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 make this some time to really reflect and see where are there parts of my own timeline that i may be holding on to some some baggage and how is that informing my relationships my business and my sense of well-being i i'm all on board with it with you on that and i and i think there's a huge thing here with the idea of masculinity or masculine energy that it seems that it has been warped in the general sense of upbringing of you know, our generation, I mean, you seem like, I think you're a bit older than I am. I think it, not to date you like forties, late thirties, 35, 35. So yeah. I guess we're, I guess you're technically still a millennial then. Right. Yeah. So it, I feel like in our generation, at least it does feel like majority of the masculine figures very much put out this energy of, or this idea that you're not supposed to ask for help. You're not supposed to show weakness or even more so that vulnerability is a sign of weakness. And it's crazy because as I've been on this introspective journey, vulnerability seems to be like one of the biggest senses of strengths that you can almost come across. And maybe you even saw that in that AA meeting. And where I'm interested in taking this conversation is to ask you about your relationship with your own masculine energy. And, you know, I, I think traditionally speaking it's called like the divine masculine and i feel like you embody it very well so where how have you kind of seen masculine energy and how have you almost came into your the aaron version of divine masculine energy man i, I mean I, I appreciate that reflection i don't think i i think that i'm beginning to come into uh more of that and i i think that I really appreciate that reflection. I, in my personal experience, I see myself as like, I have a lot of work to do in that, to really uh, place myself into any representative, like, okay, like, you know, Aaron Alexander, representative of divine masculinity. <laughs> um, but I think the things that have been the most supportive in that would be, I'd say like, it sounds generic and cheesy, but like, like fail, like fail fast, mm. you know, like, fuck up your relationship, fuck up your work, fuck up your self, fuck up your health, get to a point where you're like, Oh, Oh, it's too much. Like how, how could I have done this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, I like, the, like that. Not that I mean, I think ideally try to prevent yourself from fucking all those things up, but, but for me, it, it's hard for me to learn without um, really having like a deep visceral experience of like, Oh, that, 
I, I really, I really dropped the ball. I really messed that up. And I've, every time I have done that, um, I, I really want to change and I, 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 I seek help, which is something I didn't do in the past. So that would be something as far as if I were playing some, you know, advisory role to other people and their, their journey with them, their masculine experience, I would say like, get a therapist, get a coach, get a counselor. I never wanted to do that. And I recently, uh, I started working with a, a, a therapist. I've worked with therapists in the past, but I wasn't like that into it. And they were just, we were just talking about stuff and they're like, you know, we're creating a new fortress of analyzation of what's going on, you know, and it's just, I'm like living in this new house of self analyzation. It wasn't actually hitting in an embodied way. Mm. Um, so somatic therapy has been massive, I would say for me, um, because it teaches one, the tools to be able to actually do that work internally. Sometimes I think just exclusively talk therapy without a somatic component can be a little, um, yeah, it's just, it's like, it can be topical, but if you, teaching a person to fish compared to like, just, you know, giving them fish, I think that's the somatic lens being able to have practices to actually listen in, process, integrate, all of that. Like that I think is, has been really incredibly powerful for me. But I think the main thing, honestly, is just me making mistakes. Mm -hmm. I make mistakes. They hurt so badly. I humble myself and say, I really fucked up. Like this is on me. Like I am the common denominator. This is on me. It's not you. I think the sooner a person can be in that disposition and also not go too deep in that because there is other roles in the world but i i i trend towards a direction of i try to trend to, to, to a direction as as good as i can to like quote unquote radical responsibility of how can okay i'm responsible like how can i be more responsible how you know re responsible like able to respond like how can i how can i respond to this in the in the you know, most open hearted compassionate strong stable grounded way possible and really just be honest, like, okay, where am I not addressing this in the most ground, open, grounded, open-hearted, compassionate way possible? Um, I think that would probably be kind of, you know, thing. Yeah, I, I find it very, it's a beautiful answer because it really ties in this idea of radical responsibility mixed in with the aspect of failing fast. And failing fast is something that I has been really coming into my awareness recently. And I'm curious where you see that almost from, because both of us are, you know, social media guys. We put a lot of shit out there on the internet. So how do you visualize like this? Okay, I fucked up energy, like my bad, when the ramifications could be, let's say, societal. And, and I think this is something that probably everyone could see at some level, but maybe it's more in the light of maybe it's more projected onto us because of the size of people. And so if, even if somebody has a following of a hundred people or they have their friends or family, how are they, how are you able to mentally get to this place of like, man, it's okay if I fail, it's okay if I mess up and then take radical responsibility for that. Like, how do you get past even that first step of it's okay if I fail and all these people see my failure? I'm not very specific on social media. I don't really personally care. I mean, sometimes I have. I'm very specific. I've done like podcast episodes. With my my mom, I'm like you know, wailing, crying, and done podcast episodes with uh, past girlfriends. Kind of, I actually didn't publish publish one of them. Um, so, <clears throat> I I try to keep. I don't. I'm not like, you know, Aubrey. You mentioned Aubrey before. Aubrey Marcus. He's like example. He's, he's like very open book. I'm like not as much. I, I think I, I'm more interested in sharing general themes, mm. I think is, is, is like what I feel is appropriate for myself, uh, where I don't really want strangers being in my business about stuff. And the worst thing, like I have shared about like a breakup before, um, like, I don't know, a few years ago or something and getting random strangers freaking DMing you saying, Hey bro, I heard about your breakup. I'm so, I'm like, don't need to read that like yeah. do not care <laughs> about random bro dude in cincinnati you know saying sorry about your breakup like not making it better yeah you know so so to me i think creating a little bit of if you are a person that 
does tend to be a sharer, um, whether you, you know, social media or you know, have a platform or don't or whatever, I think there is great value in not reactively sharing. So allowing space to process, because if you are reactively sharing, if you're, if there's a lot of emotion and you're writing an email to somebody, or you're writing a text to somebody, maybe pause. Like, like you're, you're not right right now. I mean, what you're saying might be right or whatever, but like your mind is not right right now. You know, so just a- acknowledging the, you know, the pattern and the history of like, oh yeah, if I'm in a reactive state, like that's not, I, I, we're seeing like my six-year-old version of myself come up or like mm-hmm. the, like that's like the baggage is coming up right now. Right. Do you really want to imprint out onto the internet in this static way? Like, okay, here's my baggage of me as a five-year-old where I wasn't fill in the blank thing. And I'm just going to give you this chaos and you're just going to see it. And you're going to, it's going to be like fodder for you to kind of grab your attention. I'm like, mm, I don't want to do that. You know, so I, I, I personally am trying to lean more into a place of what are the, the lessons in this that are actually meaningful and digestible for, you know, any, anyone else or, you know, you know, at least hopefully whoever is following my platform that's kind of more the approach that I do is, is like step back, pause, breathe, take a walk, process. What are the common themes here? What are the the golden thread lessons and what's worth sharing? And now I'll share that. And then like inner cabinet type people, therapist, close friends, et cetera. Those are the places where I'd be more open to like, oh, 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 here's all the things. Yeah. So I think there's like filters for me. Gotcha. No, that certainly, certainly makes sense. And quite frankly, as you're saying that I'm thinking in the back of my head that that's something I need to take more inventory of as is <laughs> me too. <laughs> like, and I think there's a beauty to what you're saying, right? Is to not just throw out that chaos, right? Because you're recalling that six year old, 15 year old self and putting that on stage for the world. And it's, not exactly who you're trying to be. It's just what the energy is that's coming out at that time. And instead figure out what that 15 year old's trying to communicate to you yeah. or to anyone. And then even if it's your style, relay that, be like, okay, this is what my 15 year old self was going through. Here's the lesson I learned and here's the lesson for you. And it really creates a more productive and maybe even a better lesson for the listener or anyone who's going to come across that information you know it's like it's like be like be if i'm doing that hypothetically in a situation i think there's also i mean i've seen people posting stuff and it's just like and i've even had this experience before where i'm crying i'm having like an emotive i'm like wow this is this is great like i am crying like this is i love like i'm so grateful to be able to feel in this way and like man i would like to share this like for other people like this is a cool thing um and you know, I've never done that. I've never like grabbed the phone and done that. Um, but it's crossed my mind before because I do share a lot of stuff and I've seen people do that or whatever, where they're like, you know, they're like a picture of them in their bed and they're just crying and they like share mm. that as a fucking feed post. Um, and I'm like, okay, like I get that. There's also value in saying, um, this is also a part of me. I'm not just doing muscle ups you know and sprinting on the beach i'm also like this emotional being and this is a layer of me and i'm allowing you to see this part of me so i'm gonna allow you to see this other part as well you know and there's not a um like rules and regulations of you know what you're allowed to see of me because what that can i think do as well I'm, i'm like being contrarian to my to my myself right now but what that can do as well is It can start to, I think, limit if people look up to you and look up to lots of different like quote unquote mentors on the internet and they only see one flavor of those, those people, I think it can start to invalidate other types of sensations that are very honest and very authentic that they have. And they feel like no one else has those because they literally, they feel alone in their life. And so someone putting out this other part of, man, I feel fucking scared, man, I feel ashamed, man, I feel sad, man, I feel alone. You know, I think there is value in having like all of those parts. It's just, it's just a, a choice for you. I think it's, it's, it's wise to take a conscious choice of like, what do I want to share? I do not need to share everything. Mm-hmm. If I'm an educational platform, 
I can just share education. You know, if I'm a emotional, spiritual, whatever platform, I'll probably be sharing more emotional stuff. You know, but I think that if 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 a person does choose to just be flippantly sharing times where they're having in some reactive response and they're like, get the phone out and they're sharing that thing. I think what you're doing there is a, in some ways it's a little lazy uh, because now instead of you interpreting that to be like digest and process and be like, here's something of value to engage with. You're essentially saying like, I need a therapist here, 10,000 people you analyze Mm. And please give me some interpretation because I need help, obviously. And here's the video. There's nothing. There's it's just it's just raw emoting. Um, you know, I don't know. For for me, I th- I think I I kind of lean more towards a place of like I try to authentic authenticity as much as I can. Is that that's a lesson in and of itself, but also education. And a part of education is processing. For sure. So I'm just going to give you a bundle of chaos. I'm kind of like. I don't know, was that for me or was that for you? I mean, that, I think that's really the question. Is this for me or is this for you? If it's for you, it really truly is for you, then it's, it's probably good. But if it's for me, it's it's something to, to look at because it's lazy and like maybe borderline rude. That's an interesting perspective to take as well. Am I, is this, right? Is it lazy, right? Because if you're just honing into that emotion and just putting that out there, of course there's utility to that, but that's not in a sense helping. I mean, it could Uh, I don't want to say harm, but if you're just, you're just putting that energy out there. Right. And if that's the energy you want to associate with, I guess go for it. But I don't know. There's a think of social, think of social media, like you're, like you're building, which I'm obviously an expert of social media or, you know, know, most things, most everything we're talking about. I'm, I definitely like, am not an expert. These are all just me pretty much just talking about life and my, my experiences. Uh, The only things that I would claim any realm of authority in at all really would be the conversations around like okay if your back hurts your shoulder you know your shoulder issues hip issues whatever um so just prefacing i'm (laughs) not i'm not the expert always good to put that out there (laughs) um but with social media i think i got i got this from a friend um because i was actually asking i mean i was actually aubrey i was i I actually messaged aubrey because i was going to post a thing and I was like, I don't know about this. It feels like a little, I don't, I don't remember what it was exactly. But his response was um, thinking of your thinking of your social media feed as like a painting, essentially. And so everything that you're doing, it's not, you know, right or wrong or whatever. It's just you're just creating a painting. And so looking at it is just like an expression of art. It's not you. Like, it's just an expression of art. It's past. It's a skeleton. You know, so you know, you don't need to think too much. You know, if you're, if you're doing a painting, I don't think you need to overanalyze and be too scrupulous of like, you know, like the green and the red and the teal. It's just like, cool. I'm just making a painting. Oh, I'd like to have some tears in the painting. I want to have some like raw, crude emotion in here. Cool. All right. I want to have a little education. Okay. I want to have a butt shot. I want to, you know, I want to show my butt, you know, I want to, I want to infuse like some sexuality in the painting, you know? And at the end it's like, cool. Do you like your painting? You know, do you like your, Twitter feed? Do you like your Instagram feed? Do you like, you know, your your life is a painting? Do you like your car, your house? You go in your house. It's an expression. Your clothing, you know, your communication style. You know, you can really start to overlay that like painting artistic lens on most aspects of your life. Your, your movement, the way that you move. That's an absolutely beautiful way to look at it. Because I know, especially whenever I like really get into editing a good clip from one of my interviews, I'm like, oh, fuck yeah, like this needs to be out there. And I don't even care who comments, who likes, who, you know, whatever. It's just like, yeah, like this is, this needs to be there. And I, that's cool. It's something I've been really trying to feel into more whenever going into that creating round. But let's, let's pivot a little bit here, right? Cause I, (laughs) I enjoy talking about this with you, but let's get a little bit more into your kind of specialization, I suppose. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm happy talking about all sorts of stuff, but yeah, I mean, don't feel like it's like polite to do so. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm open. Well, to it touches on it. It, it. it touches on a little bit of like the life and the balance and all of this stuff, uh, which is, I recently started doing Goda, uh, for those who've never heard of it, G O A T A. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at the Align podcast and I saw you were talking to someone about Goda mm-hmm. and where this is gets... the, the, the goat, the Goda founders about Goda. Oh, was it? Oh, okay, cool. That's <laughs> so you oh, went you to the froze. source. <laughs> Are we nice. good now? All right, cool. You went, you went to the source. Nice. 
Can you can you see me? You you froze there for a second on my side. All right, I see and hear you. We good? Yeah. Oh, did it freeze on your side too? Uh, just small glitch. But are you good? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I stopped. I was I was I was talking to the 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 well one of the founders of Goto, Gil, and then his other one of his like the the t- notorious Goto people called Bam, which now they've apparently all like fallen apart and. Not, not falling apart, but like they've disassembled or whatever. So they're not a part of that anymore. But that's, yeah, that's, that's who the podcast episode was with. Cool. And so, so where I wanted to link this back to is almost kind of like what we were talking about with the awareness and perception, which is, you know, here's a new, and here's what I'm, how I'm seeing it in my life, right? Like here's a new form of, let's say movement or exercise that has come into my life and I'm not sure what to do with it because part of me thinks like, okay, yes, like the way I'm moving are certain angles that I haven't hit before. Then there's another part of me that kind of sits there and says, yeah, we, we haven't done this before. And there's a reason we haven't done this before. We shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious where you kind of find this balance and we can use Goda as an example of, yes, I should lean into this because this is the more, let's say this is a higher mobility way of movement versus transcending the or you're transcending the thought process like almost the comfortability thought process the the piece of you that says no we're comfortable doing what we're doing it's got us to this point in time there's no reason to experiment with something else so how do you almost balance and find out like oh go to the truth like i need to dive into this go 100 percent versus no, 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 no. We've gotten here before. Like we don't need to add anything else to the puzzle. Mm. Yeah. I mean, follow your intuition. I think if you, if, if it's, you know, if it's not broke, maybe you don't need to fix it. But for, for me, I come more from the lens of, I'm like a hobbyist but with, with movement modalities and all. I'm just like, I'm interested. I'm like aficionado. I'm like, oh, cool. Like, what are you doing? You know, I'm the same with religions and like philosophies and like most things. It's like how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm. I want to learn about if I go to a, a new culture someplace and everyone, you know, s- sits on their heads to eat at, at dinner and they have some story of why, you know, doing a headstand throughout dinner is good for you. I listen. I'm not going to be like, oh, this is it. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to become the headstand dinner guy for the rest of my life <laughs> because I saw this culture and wherever. But I'm like, wow, cool. Like, I like, I want to hear about that. Like, tell me, you know, okay, I'll, I'll try it. And if, and see if it works, does it make me feel better? Did it make digestion better? You know, probably the answer is going to be no, you know, but I'll, I'll try it. And, and so I think for me, that's just like my personal personality. Everyone has different personalities and they're going to be strengths and weaknesses to different personalities. And that's why people, the, the greatest power of people is cooperation and connection and community. Because the way that I think is different the way that you think is different the way that anybody else thinks. So we bring each other together and we start to lean into t- to these different strengths and build off of each other. I think that's really powerful. So I would say f- for you, just you know, follow your own intuition of what feels good. And within that, um, you know, if, if you're a person, say, from like a, a dietary perspective, which there's, there's an easy analogy for movement related stuff. If you're so blurred with your nutritional profile because you just eat so much garbage, you know, and so much processed this and, and it's just mm. like and you're eating nine times a day and you're always snacking and you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's doing what you have no relation. There's no anchor point for you. So y- your data as far as like actually running the experiment with yourself of like, okay, how do grapes affect my digestion? You're like, you just don't know because it's so messy, you know? And so within that, I, I'd say like, uh, I think there is value in a certain level of exclusion, you know, and like intentionality and say, cool, like I'm going to create some space. I'm going to really try this align method, this go to this knees over toes, this freaking CrossFit, this whatever. And I'm just going to give it a try. See if if it helps, I'm going to keep doing it. If I feel better, I'm going to keep doing it. If I don't, I'm going to stop and I don't care what anybody else says, you know? And I think that like really having that autonomy and sovereignty and confidence in yourself, you know, is something that's like just an invaluable tool. And I I think it it comes from, um, you know, again, like more listening to yourself, like less, does it make you, does it feel better? Does it feel intuitively correct when you hear the founder talking about it? 
do you resonate you know mm. with that person you're like wow like whatever journey this gal or fella is on like i'm into it like i like the way that they're thinking i like the way that they move i like the appearance of their movement and like their their physical body if this is like a modality like a movement exercise thing like okay like i have buy-in like like that the, like you're showing me the trail you're showing me the, the trail that you're on the path that you're on and the location that you arrived all right i'm interested and then from there not being too kind of like um gullible in a way to just throw away your own autonomy and your own sovereignty sovereignty and your own like listening to like what feels right for you like still maintain yourself along the journey um but yeah i think just like following what what feels right is something that's a very nebulous non-scientific response to that but you know when people when, when you see something it could be an ad you know or it could be like a social media profile or whatever the thing is there's something that like resonates about it and it doesn't make it better or worse than anything there's no absolute which is one of the, the grimes the gripes that i have with goda i think the branding's good for being like inflammatory and provocative but bad for being like true you know greatest of all time actions does not make sense worst of all time actions or you know athletes or whatever does not make sense if you look at lebron james if you look at uh you know a lot of like the highest level runners if you look at like a lot of the the highest highest level athletes it doesn't match certain dogmas and and modalities and perspectives on like the perfect movement hmm. because the anthropometry of each person is a little bit different you know and your origin and just like the like the the shape and the physics and the geometry of your body it's not all the same so then it comes into like okay cool like great information but i really need to trust my intuition as well and if there's a movement that feels good for me, it's probably good for me. And if it doesn't feel, it feels like it's not working, um, you know, just try something else. Like your best move is the next move is something that, um, I don't know who said that originally, but it's a, a, it's a good, good idea. Uh, it is a good idea. I think another <laughs> good idea that you laid out in there was the idea of having this anchor point because it that really resonates with me, right? And kind of ties into what we were talking about with social media is if you're in this place of chaos, whether it's with your exercise or diet, you eat, you know, fruits and vegetables one day, the next day you're eating cake and sugar. And then the next day you're back to eating protein and meats or versus like even you're working out in the gym, you do bench press one day and then you run the next. And if you have all this chaos in your exercise and diet, then trying something else is going to almost not be you know, bring you back to a scientific place, you're not going to have the scientific data to know which of these things is doing well. And so you almost need to be able to create that baseline. So maybe in your life, like how have you been able to create that baseline, whether it's with, whether it's with relationships to yourself, whether it's with food, whether it's with exercise, how do you look to create that baseline to then expand on that and say, here's my baseline. Now let me go and test all these little different things and see which one raises my baseline. You just establish a routine. So <clears throat> it's like having like, cool, like I wake up at whatever, seven o'clock each day, go to bed around 11 o'clock. I eat breakfast around this time. I train around this time and just kind of establishing, you don't, you know, you don't need to do that to, you know, to each his own, but having some type of baseline scheduling for yourself, like routinization is helpful for the human for the most part. Some personalities, maybe not so much, but I think generally speaking, you know, sorting out your circadian rhythm and such is valuable. Um, and within that, if you have a general pattern with the way that you do your day to day, then that starts to clear some space to start to experiment, you know, and say, cool, what if I go to bed at 2 a.m.? See how I feel. What if I, cool, I've eaten this, this same consistent meal, meals, you know, two meals a day, three meals a day, one meal, like whatever you're into, six meals a day, whatever you're into. Um, that I feel like the best as far as I know with this. And I have that baseline set. It's not just complete chaos. Now we can start to kind of twist and pull and, you know, adjust some levers and see how it affects. So I think just having like, like routine, I think is very powerful. So that way, if you have routine, then you don't have as much to think about, which opens up bandwidth for other stuff. So it's like, what do you want to focus on? Do you want to focus a lot on you know, what you're going to cook that day, 
<clears throat> or focus on, you know, what, I don't know, the Netflix documentaries you're going to watch until three in the morning each night or focus on the different types of clothes that you could wear that day? Or do you want to kind of clear up, clean up some of that bandwidth and just get yourself down to routine? And then from there, you can start to, you know, play with augmenting it. I think that could be one response to it that would work for, you know, me at least. No, I think it's a really good one because I know I read somewhere, I'm sure there's a scientific study and I bet you know it, something about how we can only make so many decisions a day. And so if every second of the day you're literally making decisions, it's going to wear you out. You're not going to really know. Yeah, but you like you, decision fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, paralysis by analysis is another term thrown around in those conversations. There's like so many decisions. You're like, Ugh, you just don't do anything. Well, there's literally infinite, right? In every single moment, there's literally infinite decisions that you could make. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's and great. maybe only one, you know, it depends on how you, how you look at it. Right. I, and I guess that comes back to figuring out like where you want to go, where you're at right now and how you kind of want to transform your life as you're, as you're moving through it. Right. What What's that painting that you want to create? Yeah. Yeah. And then also coming into being, you know, grateful for what you have. Because then you can run another, you can run another <coughs> pernicious game of uh, I will be happy when and okay, like I'm not really satisfied with this, which I think there is something to be like, yeah, I'm kind of a piece of shit. Like this is I'm fat, fucking lazy. Uh, I can't hold a job. I can't hold a relationship. Uh, you know, like I don't have, you know, like my 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 relationship with my parents is is crap. My you know, I look outside and it's just dreary. It's like, bro, you got to change, dude. Like, mm. you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. Like, whatever you're doing, not working. <laughs> and having having that honesty with yourself is valuable. It's meaningful. Like, the, the, the and this gets into kind of like the other conversation that becomes uh, provocative and popular, but like, you know, giving everybody a trophy. It's like, give yourself self-love you know, and, and acceptance for exactly where you're at to be able to move forward and also be honest with yourself where it's like, this is not cutting it. This is not acceptable. Like that's love. You know, so it's, 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 there's, there's a, a blend, there's a nuance to everything. It's not, it's not just, oh, love yourself. Like it is love yourself. And it's also being able to grab yourself by the collar and say, this isn't cutting it, bro. <laughs> like we need to do better. It's like, right. Oh, okay yeah you're right i love you fucking stop being so lazy <laughs> you're like all right all right let's go <laughs> and we're back to, back to the masculinity um yeah. but dude well, that's the ma that's the masculine feminine that's the balance oh for sure right i i love you feminine listening you're like like contact like ah i'm with you don't be a fucking piece of shit get oh, off okay dad. Yeah. okay <laughs> like, <laughs> right yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Aaron, I'm going. I got you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so wild, dude. Aaron, let's get you out of here, man. I'm super grateful for your time. Thank you for being here, man. It was a great conversation. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Thanks for doing it. Cool. Uh, um, I love giving the space to my guests. Plug. I, I know you got a program coming up. I'm really interested in hearing about it. So, like, what's going on in your life? What's uh, any encouraging word for the guests or the audience? You're the guest. Uh, yeah. <laughs> floor is yours, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for, for asking. So the thing that I'm the most by far excited about is we're launching a program that I've been working on consistently for the last 10 months. It might be even a year. Uh, and it's essentially the digital version of the book with a lot more exercises and training. Um, the first week is completely free, which is exciting. So people can jump on there and try that in that you'll get a movement assessment. So you can establish a movement baseline, understand the range of motion that you have access to in all your major joints, which is a big deal just to establish same thing like we were talking about, like figure out like, where am I at? You know, so in that first week, establishing where the heck you're at. And then we also get into fundamental mobility techniques in that week that you'd learn from any really good manual therapist or physical therapist that if you've ever used a foam roller or a resistance band or a myofascial ball, or you've ever done yoga or you've stretched, uh, it would behoove you to understand these basic fundamental techniques that when I learned them, it like completely changed my, the game on the way that I work with clients. Um, and it's not like a secret. It's like, it's like pin and stretch, contract, relax, PNF, 
um, and some other stuff. Really traction, joint traction. Uh, so really like fundamental, everyone just ought to know this stuff is really what the first week is about. And so that's free. And you can find that at alignpodcast.com slash AMP, which stands for Align Method Program. Uh, and then the rest of the program, it's cool. It's super fun. There's a schedule for each week to tell you exactly what, you, what to do. Week two and three is recovering full functional range of motion of all the major joints in your body. Week two is lower body. Week three is upper body. Week four is uh, connecting some of these like rotational movement patterns that we've kind of talked about a little bit in this conversation. Uh, week five is nervous system regulation. Week six is environment. So you get to a point where your existence in your day to day life makes you healthier, makes you stronger, makes you more flexible, increases longevity. So I'm freaking excited about it. I think it's cool. Uh, I'm excited to share it. And like I said, first week is free. So it's a line method or line podcast.com slash AMP. Sweet, man. And I definitely know that I'll be signing up for that first week because you look, you look yeah, great. Check man. It out. And you look great, man. I'll be honest. I, <laughs> I, I, I got a, I got about a, a little five to 10 pounds of fat that I'm need to cut off here. And I'm definitely going to yeah. come down to where you're at. So guys, go check it out. I'm going to drop his links down in the show notes. If you learned something from this, please share, uh, follow Aaron on all of his stuff and check out his podcast. Cause it's pretty dope. Gets a little bit more of that Thanks. scientific grounded nature that we sometimes overlook on this podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, I think it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool but Aaron thanks again man and conscious monkeys I will see you guys in the sixth dimension